Welcome to the Stockout. This is the show at Freight Waves where we set aside 26 minutes to talk about the CPG and retail industries and how those relate to the uh, transportation and logistics uh, industries. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Bowdendistel, joined by Grace Sharkey. And today we're going to talk about um, the wholesale prices, the PPI and wholesale trends, what that we think that means for CPG. We'll talk a little bit about the air and ocean markets, which is something that is getting to be, I think, more on top of mind for companies that manufacture goods overseas and want to get those goods imported ahead of a peak season. And then uh, we'll talk about an article that Grace, you found for, for us um, on the toys market and what we think about the evolving um, toy industry, which really has changed a lot um, in, in recent years. I don't think I fully appreciated um, that uh, be beforehand. <laughs> um, I guess you didn't have a chance to do your intro um, interview with, with with Kaylee, so we'll make up for lost time <laughs> on on that. Um, so that'll be good. And before we do that, I want to make sure everyone knows how to sign up for the Stockout newsletter, which you, all you have to do is go to www.freightwaves.com forward slash the Stockout, and you sign up for that and try to have one out every week. Um, so with that, I guess we'll go into the first topic here, which is the wholesale. Prices decline in May, which is something that I think um, you know was a positive surprise. Did see that the the Treasury markets you know move a little bit in, in response to that. So basically, producer prices fell 0.2 percent in May from the prior month. This is according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, up 2.2 percent year over year in May, which actually remarkably isn't too too high uh, above the the Fed's target of, of 2 percent. Um, you know they do tend to prefer the the CPI over the PPI. But still, if the PPI is down a little bit over 2%, if it stays in that range, you would think that the CPI would adjust to, to, to that level. Um, and you sort of break that down, um, it, it shows that it's flat for, for services and down 0.8% for, for goods. That's that's a breakdown of that 0.2% month over month decline. So goods, prices of goods falling, um, price of, of services flat. And it seems like the biggest energy, uh, our biggest driver of this is energy prices. You might have noticed uh, gasoline lower um, and foods also down a, a little bit. So I think those are good news for the average consumer. Um, you know, diesel prices in particular being down so much of uh, you know diesel gets filtered in through the prices of other items. So I think that's really sort of what you're seeing. And so it remains to be seen whether or not that is um, sustainable. But Grace, wanted to see if you have any thoughts on whether you think that's going to trickle down into CPG industry? Uh, I, I want to say no. Just uh, clearly we've seen comments from leaders in the space touching on it. And it also reminds me quite, uh, it's very familiar to the kind of the grocery side of things as well. We've seen foods, uh, produce prices starting to go down. We haven't really seen that trickle into what we're seeing in, uh, as we you know cash out at the grocery store too. And I think, uh, a lot of these leaders are just assuming that uh, most of us, and by our behavior, it's probably true that we're going to continue to to go, and we're almost used to that elevated prices at this point in time. Uh, so I don't think there's a huge urgency to bring that down as well, especially I mean on the food side too. It's interesting, like uh, we're starting to almost compete at a level of of even going out and uh, is it cheaper to just, you know, buy groceries and, and cook at home and uh, the price to, to go out and eat too. So, but when it comes to the CPG side, I think we'll see the same trend where it's, uh, you might see the actual uh, price to, to produce the product is going down, but I don't think that's going to be quickly uh, sent over the, that savings to the consumer as well. Yeah, I would agree with you. I, it just seems like it's not really. It's I kind of feel like the same way with like, like the railroads, where it's not really in their DNA to cut prices. It's kind of the yeah. PG companies not DNA not to cut prices, where they try to keep the price increases less than four percent a year if they can. But when their prices come down, maybe they just keep them where they are because people um, always get up, get upset if the price increases too much. But if if it's stable while their prices are down, well, people don't see that their prices are down. And there was this um, this quote by the CEO of Kelanova, uh, Steve Kalane, and he, ba he basically says he expects shoppers to adapt to the higher prices and just get used to them after a period of time. And it, it basically yeah. said, well, if they haven't cut back more dramatically by now, where we've already had lapped the, the period where you have to pay more for your student loans and the stimulus is gone, that you know just people are going to just more of their budget is going to be allocated to, you know, consumer packaged goods. And, and yes, we've seen some trading down. I don't think it's been as dramatic enough to really change those companies, um, you know, be, behavior. Um, and, and certainly 
maybe, maybe part of that's just what he was telling, you know, Wall Street. I think that those quotes were, were taken from a Wall Street conference. And, you know, if he said the opposite, the stock would, would, would certainly go down. Um, you know, look at the sonar chart for the CPI, you know, compare that to the PPI. And uh, the, the CPI is in white, the PPI, that's the price the, 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 the manufacturers are paying. And you saw um, in that period from about 2000 through 2022, their margins shrunk because the producer price increases faster than this, this, the CPI. And the opposite's been, been true here. And so it seems like the margins for most manufacturers have expanded. Uh, there, but um, so you've seen retrenchment in the PPI, but not necessarily the the, the 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 CPI. So I think consumers are getting a break on food for things that's a little bit more of a pass through, like some of the fresh foods you mentioned. Things like coffee tends to be more, yeah. more of a pass through, but the things where there's really a high degree of processing, uh, contract manufacturing, something that is you know what some people call ultra processed foods. I, it it seems like for there prices are still going to be high. Um, but but yeah, would, would 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 agree with you. Would agree with you there that um, the, the CPG companies just don't feel like they have to you know cut prices. Yeah, and I, I don't I don't think they are going to. Yeah, I don't I don't remember a time and in, in my thirty three years of of life uh, a moment where that was uh, you see the opposite effect, right? I, if anything, hopefully these elevated prices will maybe last. We won't see a huge in uptake uh, or uptick in prices because of, of costs coming down for them. But I can't remember a huge time where all of a sudden eggs just got uh, much cheaper and CPG side toothpaste, for example. Right. So I, I, I I'll, I'll definitely bet against that uh, in the future too. <laughs> yeah, so, sounds right. Um, and want to move on to the topic on the freight industry which uh, this was a really good article I read, um, you know, yesterday had a, just a small amount of downtime with all the Father's Day festivities is um, this is an article written by Eric Kulish. Um, he does a really good job covering air freight. He's also writing more, it seems, on um, the ocean freight side of things. And so he's saying that air cargo has an early peak season. What does this mean for sort of the, the actual peak season? And the, the concept of the early peak season was something that Lorianne LaRocco has been talking about too at CNBC, um, who covers the ocean market extremely closely but but some of the the highlights here from from, from the um article is the air cargo volume is actually up 16 percent year over year just in may and that's consistent with how much it's been up in the first quarter and that took the industry by surprise i mean most were expecting it to be up a little bit more like mid single digits maybe even low single digits so they, they said the industry is expecting growth of three and a half percent to four and a half percent and what they got at least so far up up 16 percent and then some of these industry associations are keeping their um forecast for the full year at, at five five percent growth for the full year so either they're expecting this was just to be a pull forward of the demand from later this year into the beginning part of this year and they're expecting it to fall off is sort of the implication of, of not having that forecast higher or it's just an old forecast i mean what one of those things uh, se seems like it's true um and then you know eric goes into a lot of detail about Sort of what's influencing some of the rates in the on, on the air, and I have a good chart from the Drury Air Freight you know index. Uh, in, we can pull up in Sonar, and what basically this uh, Sonar chart shows, if we can get it up in the, the Drury Air Freight index, is that it's really um, okay. So we have here the the white line is is Hong Kong to to L A. The red line is Shanghai to JFK, so you know, far east to the west coast and, and east coast, uh, respectively, there. And these are normally really seasonal, where uh, you use air freight when there's a time crunch late in the year. And you see the rates now well above where they were at any point before the pandemic, with the exception of certain spikes right at the holiday uh, season. So no, we're not where we were when there wasn't anyone traveling and there wasn't any belly space at all, but still a lot higher than what is normal. And what's normal is the summer rates tend to be pretty depressed because there's a lot of vacation travel. So there's a lot of flights going, you know, various places and it's just not a, 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 a busy time for, for shipping goods. And what seems to have changed there is, is a lot of this e-commerce, which the e-commerce is coming from, Fast fashion, um, Shein, uh, Tamu, and Alibaba—all these, these these Chinese, you know, companies 
really taking up a lot. He had a quote in there that says International Air Cargo Association. Anna Jolie thinks it's about 20% of global volumes are e-commerce, but he says in the Trans-Pacific lane, it's more like 60 per 70%, sometimes higher. They actually think that it'll rise in the in the third quarter. That's according to the International Air Cargo Association. Anecdotally, we've heard from sonar customers. There's one in particular who's in the energy industry, and occasionally he moves things on air cargo. And he says that it's really been difficult because of all of this fast fashion taking up so much of the space there. Um, if you're not familiar with the basic concept of um, their business model, they make the clothing to order instead of, um, and, and so in, in exchange for that savings for not having, you know, taking a lot of inventory risk because it's made to order and it's made in small batches. They use air cargo instead of ocean cargo, which, you know, normally you wouldn't really have much clothing on, on the air freight unless it's um, really high value stuff that's really time sensitive, but but certainly not, not, not cheaper stuff. So it kind of opens up this whole new market there. And then another interesting thing um, he says is that shipping by air is nine times greater than shipping by ocean, but, you know, compare that to 22 times at the start of December. Um, and, and, and part of that is that the ocean rates have really risen uh, dramatically. You can take a look at the, the Baltic Ocean, you know, index and, you know, kind of remarkably, these are higher than they were earlier in the year when the Red Sea attacks were dominating, you know, headlines. And uh, there seems now there's a, a container shortage of shortage of international containers, which you would think would, would filter into the domestic intermodal space. But um, so, so I guess my question for you is if, if you're a, a shipper and you're seeing all these trends, you know, it's hard and hard to get space in, in June, sort of, what do you think it's going to be like later in the year? Do you think this is just a pull forward of activity from later in the year and it's going to fall off? Or do you think it's going to be even tighter when we, when you get to the traditional peak season? I, I think I'd want to watch the container, um, uh, information and data a little bit closely over the next couple months to fully say that, but to see kind of the same spike and the same problem for both the air freight and the container side is, is worrisome. Um, I feel like it is a little bit of a, a pull forward in, in this regards. It just, Again, I don't see between now and then we've got the election. We talked about this before any consumer spending like spiking t to the point that inventory would have to be like emergency, I guess, inventory would have to be brought in kind of like what we saw from like more of like the 2020, 2021 era in those charts. Uh, but mm -hmm. it is the air freight one is interesting to see that. Like, I hate this. I just hate the, the term new normal, but to kind of see that. That new low of what that volume looks like, I think is is concerning for those who have relied on on air freight or, or supply chains have relied on uh, moving their their uh, inventory through air uh, to start looking at different uh, means of doing so. Maybe that's why we're seeing the spike in, in the containers as well because of uh, the concern with more of the e commerce shipping in particular. Um, so. Yeah, maybe it's a little bit of response for that, but I, I'd like to see maybe what we're seeing in August a little bit more, uh, and if this is just kind of a spike for a lot of the summer products that we expect to see. I mean, even, I, I want to say this time last year, we're seeing back-to-school purchasing near, like, the beginning of mid-July as well, right? Like, a lot of uh, people trying to, to purchase that uh, beforehand to, to avoid any issues in the early fall. So... Maybe it's a little bit of that stuff coming in early to prepare for the end of July time too. But again, it's it's concerning to see again that that new like low of what we'll see in air freight volume, and maybe it is a response of those trying to uh, maneuver their supply chains in, in different modes. And now you're seeing a, a spike in in both as well. Yeah, it does seem like the traditional seasonality seems to be. Um sort of thrown out the window here where there's just more disruptions yeah. globally. It just means you have to get, get things in earlier and maybe we'll continue to see that. I mean, I think it's possible you could have a pull forward of holiday merchandise, you know, basically now, and then you have maybe next year's merchandise gets pulled forward into the fall. Yeah. If you're worried about you know more um, tariffs coming. And then Eric also has some interesting tidbits on the ocean. So some interesting um, sort of nuggets here. He said, said Maersk estimated there's a 15 to 20% reduction in available ocean capacity in the industry across the quarter. So it does seem like the ocean carriers are managing 
capacity down. Now, some of that might be related to the longer sailings, which that in and of itself is going to take out a lot of capacity. True. Um, and then he says that um, carriers are expecting to implement peak season surcharges of, of as much as $2,000 a box. And so that could be part of why there's a pull forward. You want to avoid the surcharges. And then he says, well, there's a 12% year over year decline in schedule reliability. Um, that's in April, according to C Intelligence. <laughs> and so that's just a, another reason why you would pull forward if, if, if the reliability is, 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 is less. So, um, so all those things. And then the survey by Fredo showing that 70% of business had contracted volumes bumped, basically rolled to subsequent vessels that the ocean carriers are maybe prioritizing the, the spot activity with the spot rates being as high as they are. Uh, so, you know, that's interesting as, as well that the, the ocean carriers have that, you know, kind of degree of, of, of clout. Um, oh, it's just kind of a weird industry to me that you have a contract to do something that is basically <laughs> not, a, not really enforceable. That's always kind of a, a unique thing. I guess it happens across modes and in, in, in transportation yeah. um, there. And then another interesting staff in the article, the container leasing rates have doubled on the Shanghai to LA route to $1,100. Um, not sure what, over, over what period that is, but a doubling of container leasing rates. And so that's pretty consistent with the, the reports from, you know, Lori and LaRocco at CNBC that they certainly have a container shortage. Yeah. Um, and then you have to think that's going to translate into domestic intermodal volume that is rising because you'd have more transloading from international containers into domestic containers. You don't want to send those international containers inland. So you know, that would really make me, if I was still a stock analyst, more bullish on, on J.B. Hunt going to the quarter. I think the sonar chart on domestic intermodal volume supports that. And so you see how it's really broken out. Um, that white line is 2024. These are domestic um, intermodal containers, 53-foot loaded containers. That's J.B. Hunt's um, core market in addition to you know, Hub Group and, and, and Schneider. So they're starting to see some nice uh, volume. Uh, there. So I encourage you to check out uh, that article um, and, and others on the site. And then with the last um, eight minutes here, I think this will be a fun one. Uh, <laughs> adults are driving toy sales, according to um, what you're seeing. Can, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's uh, so there's a survey by Sir, uh, Sircana, I might be saying that wrong, that came out uh, this last week. And for all those who are fans of What the Truck and you've seen Duners, uh, of course, uh, wonderful Lego set. If you're fans of Chuck Call too, you've seen all the awesome Lego sets that Mary O'Connell has as well. Uh, it's uh, the, the adult is now becoming one of the biggest purchasers within the toy industry. Uh, consumers ages 18 and older have accounted for more toy sales in Q1 of this year than any other group and uh, surpassing as actually preschoolers for the first time. So I, I don't know how that makes me feel as someone who also has a number of Lego sets and Barbie dolls behind me as we speak, but hey, we beat the preschoolers uh, and uh, uh, top industry dollar sales though did decline over the past uh, Q1 compared to the same time in, in 2023, uh, but toy sales still remain 38% ahead of 2019 level. Levels, uh, well over $2 billion in sales. So uh, the big categories in particular, again, Legos, uh, huge there. And if you if you are a fan of Lego sets, they have a really great like rewards slash like, uh, I guess, uh, loyalty program. So I'm not surprised that adults are kind of driving and, and exploring a little bit more of the Lego sets because of that. Uh, these toys in particular, too, are really cool. The Miniverse toys where they come and uh, there's like mini foods and things like that with like resin that you can glue and, and kind of build these little toys themselves. And then uh, good old vehicles, monster trucks, all that type of stuff is is going. It's it's interesting, too, because the, the survey did kind of like break some of this stuff down. Uh, top sales. Now, I will say it looks like Squishmallows, uh, which if you have uh, a niece, nephew, kids under the age of 10, I guarantee you've got a, probably a Swiss mill somewhere in your house today it was top sales. Uh, but and this is what I wanted to, to kind of hear your thoughts on top new items. Number two for 20 uh, year to date, uh, April, 2024 is Lilo and stitch toys. So 
I will say I did some digging and apparently there's a Lilo and Stitch phenomenon where like it's it's coming back. It, it hit Disney Plus apparently this uh, past quarter. And so now there's this like resurgence of, of kids who uh, like Lilo and Stitch. So that one uh, is going through the roof too. But uh, let me ask you about that, Mikey. Are you a fan? Are you buy any collector's items, toys? Are you part of this group or is it is it just me, Juno, and Mary out here? <laughs> Well, I think it depends how you define toys. I mean, if you consider <laughs> video games to be toys, then I guess I'm a fan. True. But it's, um, you know, if you had told me that the adults are driving the toy phenomenon five or six years ago, I would have been surprised. I don't think I'm surprised in 2024. Like I have seen the Lego sets that are labeled as for ages 18 plus, and they're not labeled for 18 plus yeah. because there's anything dangerous about someone younger than 18 building them. It's <laughs> just they're for the demographic of people who have jobs. And so it's like, these are, it's 18 plus because they think only people that are over 18 have enough money for the the, the Legos or they're based on the, the, the Lego yeah. thing. They should really start, um, you know, labeling them based on um, your, your net worth. These are, these are Lego sets only for high net worth uh, in, individuals. I mean, it's um, sometimes <laughs> I, I wonder who, who buys a Lego set. That's this hundreds and hundreds of dollars, but, 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 they, but they have those. And, and I will say, I mean, there, there's, that's how Lego got to be the largest toy company in the world. They didn't do that by selling, you know, ten dollars toys. They sell it, yeah. did it by selling um, the expensive sets to to people with money. And you know, it, it's kind of like if you take this to the natural conclusion. And I don't know about you know Lilo and Stitch is is, is nice. It's family friendly. But if you if you sort of take this this targeting adults to the natural conclusion, there won't really be any toys for children. Or many toys for <laughs> children, right? Because, I mean, that's sort of what you think with video games. Yeah. There just really aren't a lot of family-friendly video games anymore. Like I have a PlayStation Five, and I try to find something that's um, I can play with my son, <laughs> and they're they're kind of the titles are few and far between. Like you, you're not going to play The Last of Us with with a with a toddler. It's it's kind of ridiculous. You'd have nightmares for for, for days. <laughs> uh, so so hopefully it doesn't go too far in that direction. I I, I feel like, um, but it, sorry, what do you think is is driving the adult toy? phenomenon. I mean, you seem to enjoy it. You think it's it's the, the Gen Z anxiety that, that just sort of takes me back to a simpler time or, or, or what do you think it is? I think it might actually be a little bit of that. I mean, I, you see, it, I actually did buy a book this weekend, so I'm going against that, but I think you see less reading and more of like, how can I uh, kind of get that like fidget uh, or, or that sit down and relaxation focus mode into something something that powers my brain a little bit uh and has a, a positive outcome maybe we, we're seeing less of course uh, uh reading i'd say across the board like books in particular now audio books and things like that are becoming more of a thing but you could even sit down build a lego set and listen to an audiobook so i think it's that that anxiety that it's something that allows you to sit down and build kind of like a mindless task uh with a really fun outcome and i mean you're absolutely right it's funny uh, walking through barnes and no it's like they they do have this like focus on the adults whether it's like the bonsai plants you can build i know valentine's day that was a big thing a lot of people instead of buying your significant other flowers it's like buy them this like giant flower lego set instead that you can build that are really cool so uh i, I don't know what it is i I will say though, like earlier, they have done an incredible job of like capturing the adults, creating rewards programs, building these like even these like miniature sets that go with much larger ones, and, and making it easy to, I, I think, uh, well, get that fix and come back for more, right? And it's uh, you see, I think more and more kids trying to find these online games, more of like the Roblox type of situation. And and now us uh, Disney adults or adults that love to, to play with Legos are, are reverting back to our days of less video games and more of those buildings. So, yeah, it is interesting. We'll see uh, what it turns into. And I hope to God that we don't end up in a society where there's not at least some fun toys for the kids, though. <laughs> Yeah, for, for sure. Um, and then what do you think <laughs> about how the, the companies are doing where it was some of these stats uh, on the financials? Uh, sales are down 1% year to date in April, which to me doesn't seem like a lot in a period of time when people are concerned about their cost of living for something that's yeah. completely discretionary. I mean, does that strike you the same way? Yeah, but I think also like to kind of look back, right? Like 
at some of the trends we're seeing, like I think Mattel is starting to focus a little bit more too on the adults in these different demographics. Uh, right. Barbie came out with not only uh, uh, toys for kids, but a lot of uh, uh, merch and merchandise uh, that I think adults were, were purchasing too. So what's interesting, I think that we're seeing maybe even to bring up Lego again, right. An ability to not only create a physical toy, but to also like enter different markets, whether it's video games, those series, movies as well, merch, et cetera, uh, and creating almost this like ecosystem of different ways of, of exploring different avenues of entertainment as well. So fun stuff there. It looks, actually, oh, it looks like we got to wrap up today for everyone out there. Uh, make sure you do sign up for our newsletter. Head to Freightways.com. You'll see all of our newsletters there at the top of the page. Make sure you join the stock out. And, of course, uh, check out us every Monday at 10 a.m. for a new episode as well. Catch our old episodes on our YouTube page, too. Make sure you subscribe, like, all that fun stuff. And we will talk with you next week.